This is a slide that I look at every day. It hangs um, above my desk in my office. And I'm actually dorky enough to have it at home. And I love it for two reasons. One, I think this is the reason that most of us get up every day to change these headlines, to really have an impact on people's health. It's also my favorite slide because I could have showed you the slide 20 years ago, and if anything, it would have been better. The headlines would have indicated sort of better health, better progress. And one could interpret that in some ways as almost a damning indictment of how we are doing. All the people in the room are working really hard to impact health. Perhaps we're not having the influence that we would like. And our hypothesis at ELISA has become that maybe as an industry we're not focused on the right things. And maybe the biggest diseases in the US are not asthma or diabetes or CHF, but instead the act of being a caregiver or having financial stress or workplace stress. So how did we get to that conclusion? Well, we, like everybody else, are sort of obsessively focused on this question of engagement and why is it that we in the healthcare space don't necessarily do a great job at engagement and we have some hypotheses that we'll share. One is we do a lot of looking at retrospective data and data that is not necessarily reflective of how real people think and live and breathe and relate to each other. So last night, um, went to this wonderful thing that Colin threw, thank you, and had a great time meeting new people and always am struck that when you meet somebody new, rarely does one introduce themselves to someone else by saying, you know, I'm Alex Drain, I have diabetes, I'm on three medications, I'm in, and I'm in a high deductible plan. But if you went to the data that my health plan knows about me, that might be all they actually have, right? Instead, what I would say openly is, I'm a stressed out mother of two, I have this crazy job, I'm caring for an aging parent, and the only exercise I get is when I walk my dog. And so we really have become intrigued with this notion that maybe we need to be getting at some of these other data points. I think another reason we might be um, having a hard time when you think about engagement is you have to think about what you're selling. And do people want to buy what you're selling? So let's think about what the healthcare space is trying to get people to do, right? We're saying get up, go work out, eat quinoa, go get your preventive screenings. And our competition, or part of our competition, is instead saying, you know, snoogle up on the couch, pop open that bag of chips, get the steak at dinner, have a third glass of champagne. So one could hypothesize that perhaps they might be more engaging because in fact what they're selling is an easier sell. Add to that that the food, tobacco, and beverage industry together spend $80 per person in the US plying their wares. Now that's not our data point, that's United's, and maybe it's wrong, maybe it's off by an order of magnitude, maybe it's off by two orders of magnitude. The point is, they're selling something people are more inclined to buy, and they have a lot more money to do it. So, maybe the healthcare space is phenomenal at marketing, and that's how we could make it up. So I'm just gonna show a couple of examples of things that many of our customers historically have sent out in an effort to get people to, let's say, engage in a diabetes disease management program a picture of a diseased kidney cell. Um, I personally would probably not come home from an insane day and go to my mail and see a picture of a diseased kidney cell and be like, oh, I can't wait to call, I'm so excited. And when you look at a, a weight management brochure, could anyone in the audience say that they know anybody who has ever decided to lose weight because they got a weight management brochure? No, but almost every single one of our plans, our big customers, have a budget line that is consistently sending out these pamphlets and these newsletters. And I have to compare this, and I, my caveat before I show this is that my board has literally said I'm not allowed to show this slide, so of course I have to do it because I think that's one of the problems in the healthcare space. This is what our competition is doing. So I am in no, and this is not from naughty magazines. This is just in magazines. So I'm not in any way, shape, or form advocating that the healthcare space needs to go over here or that this is how we have to start being engaging. No, I'm just saying that if we're over here, Maybe we need to come a little bit farther over this way. So being somewhat, I would say, intimidated or cowed, really, by the challenges of engaging people and ultimately influencing their behavior, we started thinking about maybe we need to be asking different questions, questions that in and of themselves are more reflective of how real people make decisions, what makes them tick. And if we knew these things, perhaps we could do a better job marketing to them and ultimately influencing their health. So about six years ago, we started gathering these different data points about two years ago, we made it much richer. And the lucky thing about our platform is we gather literally millions of data points. We can gather millions of data points a day from real people living out in the wild. So really quickly we were able to amass 
some perspective, and I'll share really quickly some stuff that we saw with the Medicare Advantage population, specifically that seniors, Medicare Advantage members, seniors with diabetes were less clinically en engaged than younger populations with diabetes. And of those, members with lower clinical engagement scores were up to 80% less likely to get preventive screenings like, you know, or their screenings that they should get, LDL, A1C, whatever it might be. And those who were non-adherent also tended to be caregivers, they tended to be stressed out financially, they tended to be less activated, they were less likely to do the things that you asked them to do. So this started to intrigue us that maybe the concept that health is life and these life factors are really influencing us and when life goes wrong, we go wrong with something that we should dig into. And we launched this research and analysis initiative called The Unmentionables, which we thought was a super clever name. And the first thing we did was enlist Wendy Lynch, whom some of you might know. She's really um, a da great data geek, very renowned for being very buttoned up from a... Um, data and analytics sort of street cred perspective. And we did that because we knew we were ultimately hoping to find data that would lead us to want to influence our big customers to redefine the scope for which they felt responsibility in someone's health, to redefine what health actually is. And if we were going to ask them to do this, we had to have good data. We went out to a demographically representative, statistically significant population to ask people, are these things true for you? And you can read on the left what the unmentionables were, and 95% of people said at least one was true for them. 40% said between four and six. These weren't older people. They weren't less wealthy people. These weren't sicker people. It was all of us. We then said, if this thing is true for you, on a scale of one to seven, to what extent is it defining your life? And you'll see that the top five were all pegged towards seven. Money concerns, bad sex life, relationships, caregiver stress, and job stress. Then we wanted to measure the gap between how much does this thing define you, how much does it torture you, and how supported do you feel by the healthcare space in it? And then we loved the name that we came up with, which was the ostrich index, to poke fun at the fact that we're probably all sticking our head in the sand about the factors that are actually driving health. And what you'll see is that the ostrich index is very big for those non-traditional life factor issues, but very small, meaning supply and demand are matched for things like diet and exercise. We also went on to look at the relationship between the unmentionables and self-reported health. And the literature, more and more, keeps coming out with evidence that these things are true, that if you're a caregiver, you have twice the rate of depression, um, your immune system is compromised, you use the hospital and the ER more, you don't get your preventive screenings. And we saw the same thing, which is people who report having four or five unmentionables are over five times more likely to report bad health, and people who said they did not were much more likely to be healthy. We also saw this with productivity. And I want to tell you what you're looking at here is someone who said, yes, I am stressed out financially, 50% of that population went on to say, and it significantly negatively impacts my health. Now, performance is notoriously underreported because no one's going to volunteer and raise their hand and say, you know, I suck at my job. So the fact that we're at 50% means it's probably higher, which is, you know, a humbling statistic to look at. And I will say that we had great fun with our board around the bad sex life by saying to them, which was inappropriate, obviously, um, if you can make our you know, home life better, maybe we'll be more productive at work. They shut us down. Um, we also saw the presence of something I'll sort of call coping mechanisms, positive coping mechanisms we call buffers. This is the idea that you have a strong network of peers, strong sense of spirituality, and if you exercise, those are the top three in the literature and that we found, you in fact have positive coping mechanisms. So when bad things happen, you handle it better, but there are also these negative coping mechanisms that we called magnifiers, where when something bad happens, you can go into downward spiral, and those are trouble sleeping, depression, and substance use. Not substance abuse. We're not saying you're a teetotaler. We're just saying you have three glasses of wine instead of one. And most of us have probably had an experience where things are bad at work, you have the three glasses of wine, it wakes you up at three, you start thinking about the work, you start to feel blue, and you can have this downward spiral. Having a high ratio of magnifiers bad to buffers good, coping mechanisms, seven times more likely to report bad health. Now the good news is, I'm a mom now and I do a lot of, I'm cold, so you wear a sweater to my children. And I think the healthcare space does that a lot. I think this is a problem, so I'm gonna solve it for you. So we said, well, to be fair, we should probably go ask people, do you want help on this stuff? It's clear it's an issue for you, but would you let us help you with it? 80% of folks would like help from doctor or health plan on financial stress, 95% on caregiving, zero difference when you change the question to be from employer. I've never seen a stat like that in the 20 years that we've been talking about the different brands that can bring you support. And our interpretation of this was people are saying, I don't really care who helps me, somebody has to help me, I'm drowning. 
So we boiled all this down and kept coming back to, well, what does this mean? What does this mean? How do we make it actionable? And we came up with the notion of vulnerability. And really what we're talking about is vulnerability. And vulnerability is made up of a combination of these life obstacles. We chose to focus initially on being a caregiver, financial stress and relationship stress, and then your positive and negative coping factors. So how well do you, are you equipped? How strong are your coping mechanisms? And it let us lay out a population based on vulnerability. So we could quickly identify in a world of limited resources, which is the world that we live in and our customers live in, how do we do a better job allocating resources to those who really need it because they're, they're really having an issue, they're less likely to be healthy, they're less likely to be productive, and most importantly, that we're actually providing support on the things that are driving in their mind and actually, in reality, driving their health and driving their productivity. So we'd be more focused on solving the problems that they wanted help. And then we wanted to compare the power of this notion of vulnerability to the other variables that we traditionally look at, like disease, a composite of 15 conditions. And we looked at what, per, what percent of the variability in self-reported health is predicted by chronic disease, and saw that about 9% was for self-reported health and 1% for productivity went on to say, OK, well, now we buy all this extra data. We can get demographics. We can get third-party information. How powerful is that in predicting variability? Got another 2% for self-reported health, 1% for productivity. And then ultimately, what we were really looking for was what we saw was that close to a four times increase in the ability to predict variability when you look at the data that is resident in this concept of vulnerability. And as importantly, sometimes we've had uh, insights that we thought were really, really clever, and actually all we found is just a marker for BMI or a marker for income, and in fact, that was not the case. So the data that's resident in this vulnerability index and this concept of life factors that hit you, hurt you, and how well you cope with it actually is new information. And when you look at it specific to a challenge in the healthcare space, for example, like adherence that we're all working on, it has value. So what you, if you compare the yellow bar to the yellow bar, People who are saying they're forgetting to take their medication, the vulnerable population, almost twice as likely to be forgetting. Those who say they're not taking it, more willful. It's usually because of cost or side effects. But you still see that doubling, so almost twice as likely. Imagine being able to use this when you're trying to focus those limited resources on folks who are having trouble with adherence. So our hypothesis is that maybe if we want to get from these headlines to these, we have to avoid the American hunger for supersizing everything. And instead of saying it's more and more data that we need, no, 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 it's better data that we need. And specifically, data that maybe requires us asking different questions of people, fundamentally different questions, questions that they'll be okay answering, questions that they want help with to help address their vulnerability. And then I want to leave with this one concept, which is let's say we do that. Let's say we do a great job that all of us Together, these data sources, other data sources come together and have this unbelievable, rich, genuinely reflective of how real people live, breathe, make decisions, become healthy, don't be healthy. Um, if we continue to just send people pictures of diseased kidneys or weight management brochures, it's not going to have the impact that we want. And so, again, certainly not advocating that we have to do anything remotely as outrageous as this, but let's just keep trying to pull ourselves to be you know, more full of joy and soul and humor, have a little whimsy, flirt a little bit, be out of the box, compete for the mind share more effectively given the challenges that we face. So that ultimately, I wanted to use the word right size data, but I think right size has such a negative connotation. Nobody hates Goldilocks. So the concept being, you know, not too much, not too little, we have to have data that's just right. And then we need to package that in a way that not only goes the last mile, but someone said to me the other day, we've got to go the last three millimeters. Right? We have to get to people, and we have to get under their skin. So how do we take all this knowledge that we can call signal from noise to understand what's driving people's behavior and then develop communication strategies and services and products and marketing, really, that ultimately influences people to change their behavior in a sustainable way, and that is how we will have the greatest impact, and thank you.